Welcome to DivCasts from University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. All right, folks, we'll get, we'll get started. Um, I won't say much by way of introduction. If you don't already know Nick Naffel and David Frankel, you have no one to blame but yourself. <laughs> uh, and as an alum of the Divinity School and our uh, stalwart bibliographer in religion and philosophy, and David's a PhD student in history of Judaism, um, we're thrilled to have them here to be running, teaching the research paper at the undergraduate level. Um, only one announcement um, for now, which is that we have two more, um, two more craft teaching sessions this quarter. One is the uh, annual syllabus workshop. Uh, currently annual, I'm working on getting more. Um, that will be February 27th, and if you are interested in that, you need to apply in advance with Professor Peck, their details on the website. And the other event is March 5th or 6th. March 5th or 6th, sorry about that. Um, but it's with David Craigle uh, of, of Grace University on uh, the introductory class as um, as rite of passage. It's called liminal pedagogy, and she promises to be a very, very interesting talk. So, um, other than that, I will turn it over to Ann and David. Yeah, I'm just making sure. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, just a little bit of introduction. Uh, the uh, project came about uh, between uh, David and me and, and Brandon um, coming up with uh, thinking about what would be a, a, a interesting uh, workshop to lead. And um, actually, getting ahead of myself, the reason that we, David and I were talking to Brandon is because David this year is uh, uh, is in a uh, librarianship internship, which is a, um, it's actually a pilot program that uh, I and some faculty members have been uh, thinking about for a while. And so David, as some of you probably know, was already working in acquisitions at the library. And so um, we, we asked him to uh, expand that work a little bit and to work with me uh, to sort of get some hands-on experience on an academic uh, librarianship. Um, which has been wonderful. Uh, and uh, so part of that is uh, reaching out to the, to the community that the library serves. Um, so uh, some, you probably also realize that uh, David has never actually taught the research paper. <laughs> um, uh, and you might be wondering why is David leading this workshop, and I will tell you. <laughs> uh, the reason is because we, we decided to have it sort of as model the experience that you're going to go through, right? All of you are, are more than likely going to be sort of dropped into a situation where you're expected to do all sorts of things in the classroom that you have not done before um, and teach areas that you're not familiar with or, or you know, that you are you know, tangential to your area of expertise. Uh, and so uh, we thought the, the way to lead to uh, show you how you might go right about that would be to have somebody who um, uh, who hasn't done this sort of puzzle out how he would go about uh, putting this together. And the way that he puzzled it out is sort of through uh, seeking the help of people who have done it, right? Uh, so he's been working with me to figure out how uh, the best way to, uh, for, to introduce students to different types of resources at the library. And we also met with a number of, uh, consulted with a number of uh, students who had uh, taught the BA seminar in religion. And so they have gone through, taken students through that long process of writing their BA theses. Um, and so I just want to, by way of, of a plug, sort of <laughs> say that uh, when you, I think, when you start teaching, out, just in general when you start teaching, but especially when you start teaching at different institutions, I want to make sure that you are aware that you can contact the librarians at that institution, and they are there to help you um, with anything that might come up with your teaching. It's often the case with adjuncting that um, you sort of you get hired, and then they just you know let you go, and um, there's not much checking up on you. 
um, which on the one hand is nice because you know they uh, trust you to do your job, but on the other hand can be um, you know frustrating because you don't know if you're doing the right thing and you're not sure how the system works because it's not your university and blah blah blah. Librarians are. Um, a great resource in that situation. I mean, the other faculty are good resources too, but um, oftentimes uh, you, you might get the most help from the librarians. Um, so they'll have, uh, and they should have all sorts of resources already set up uh, in, uh, ready for you to take advantage of. For instance, I, I suspect um, if I've done my job, you all already know about the research guides. Um, so we have a, like a religion resource guide. Um, these live guides are pretty standard now across um, America, uh, U.S. North American uh, universities, and so um, they're more than likely any college or university that you work at is going to have something similar like this for their for their various sub by, made put together by their various subjects specialists and the. Um, of course, while you're still a student here, you can use mine. You can access all of this information through your, um, as an affiliate of the United, University of Chicago, but your students right, have to go through their system. And so that's another reason why it's going to be important for you to familiar, familiarize yourself a little bit with the system of the school you're at um, so that you can um, direct students to how, how they um, work in the library. Because the truth of the matter is, is that most undergrads, when they get to the stage of writing a research paper, they've, they've probably not used the library that much from beyond a space for them to study in, right? They haven't, um, they might not know how to go get books out of the library, right? You know, they might not know how to read a call number, you know? So you want to, um, some of them might be very advanced, but I think for the most part you want to assume uh, a general, not that they're not smart, but just a general lack of knowledge of how to do these things. Um, and so it's uh, the, the, the line that you have to tread then is to sort of teach, uh, figure out what you need to teach them without um, sort of treating them like babies, right? <laughs> so, um, but I think that that covers what I wanted to introduce. And then, so I'm gonna hand it over to David. Um, unless there are any questions. Um, so you have, we, the assignments ahead of time are really just to sort of get you thinking about this. Um, I think, uh, I think David would agree with me that um, part of teaching the research paper is understanding why you're assigning a research paper. And I think before you assign it, you should really be asking yourself, do, do the students need to learn this right now, right? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But before you even jump off into that, <laughs> into doing it, you want to really reflect a little bit about why they're doing it and what they're going to learn. Mm -hmm. and so with that, I'm going to pass it off to David. Well, thanks, Sam. Yeah. So I'm David. Um, so I call this encouraging creativity because I, I had this, I, I had this question: what is, what did, what did I, what did I think a research paper was when I was a freshman in college? Elsa, what did you think a research paper was when you were a freshman in college? What, do, what was it for? It was for learning about something specific. Okay, Jordan? Uh, I thought it was an exercise in getting to know the field, like mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. checking out books and having to do things, like develop your own opinion about a, a question that's on there. Mm -hmm. I'm influencing you. <laughs> Sarah? I thought it was like about sort of gathering different pieces of information and like reassembling them. Ah, okay. <laughs> Okay. Ezra. Um, it's hard to remember what I thought as a first year, <laughs> but I, I think it's probably something like learning to evaluate sources, primary and secondary, um, and learning how to gather such sources. Right. Uh, before the yeah, I mean, uh, everything that's said, I just remember the gathering. The gathering. The gathering, the gathering was difficult, wasn't it? Yeah. Liz. Yeah, I don't know if I was as um, creative as the answers that were already given. It was mostly like to learn about one particular subject and like for a big chunk of my grade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, familiarity with the subject matter. Yeah. So it's obviously all of those things, right? Aaron, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think the um, research papers I did as a freshman, 
I thought of just taking something that was interesting from the course and following it where it would lead. Mm -hmm. so maybe we only did one day on something. I said, oh, that's really interesting. I'm going to mm -hmm. go develop that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's obviously all of those things, but um, the, the enduring understanding that I want you to take that I want you to take from me is about what I think about what a research paper is. Is a research paper isn't um, uh, just it's uh, displaying some truth that exists in the ether that you are now going to show the world. It's something creative. It's something that only you as the writer can produce for, for a reading audience. Only if Aaron were to write a research paper, Aaron is the only person who could possibly write that paper because the ideas are Aaron's and only Aaron's. Um, because when I, when I was a freshman and maybe a sophomore and maybe, maybe a junior, <laughs> I, um, I, I wasn't, I was still, I think, afraid of being too creative, being too, um, putting myself out there, putting my own ideas out there. And, and, um, but I think that is really the most important thing to teach someone who's 18 or 19 years old who's been going through high school, which is an environment where creativity isn't always fostered. So, um, May I just add? Yeah. On that last point, yet yeah, um, having come out of Jesuit high school, um, that yeah, I think it's very easy for them to get into the mindset of like you mentioned your grades of like you're doing it because you're told to do it, right? And you aren't really thinking about why you're doing it, which is why it's yeah. You know, if, if they had these reasons for doing it, how wonderful would that be, right? <laughs> so that's your job is to get those students to realize why it's fun to write a research paper. <laughs> It is definitely fun. And actually, let me go back. Problems. What are potential problems? Not with you writing your papers, because we're going to focus on how to teach others to write papers. Because we all have different ways of doing it. We we'd already know that because we run around and we all have we all have different ideas of what it was, even though what we said was our ideas from when we were freshmen. But what what are the problems that emerge from trying to teach something? For example, I taught the, the highest level of paper I ever taught was um, like uh, a, a timed essay that was part of a final exam in a class I was teaching at Ohio State. Um, I mean, that's obviously not a research paper, but there were problems because people didn't know what to read. So I had, you know, they came up to me, you know, day, day of, day before, saying, you know, I don't really know what to read. I mean, I provided, but I provided them a bibliography also. So providing a bibliography it doesn't necessarily translate it to them reading, right? Because sometimes you look at bibliography and it looks like too much, and if you if you can't do the whole thing, you're not going to do it any of it at all. So what are some other? Um, Jordan, you said you've t you've graded you've graded research papers. Uh, well, I've graded long essays. You graded you graded long essays. They would constitute a research paper. Okay. Well, um, let's brainstorm. What are some problems that as teachers, Liz? Um, well, one of the things, I work with the writing program as a tutor, and one of the main things that people come in with is that they have these like prompts for research papers, and they have no idea like what they mean or like where to go with that, or how much like the way they have within that to answer their own ideas, but not maybe necessarily like if it's a very specific prompt or like if it's way too broad. Do you think it's possible to encourage creativity with a prompt? With a prompt? Yeah. I think you can. There are some really good prompts that people come up in with. I'm trying to think of an example, but yeah. most of them are either way too specific or broad can like be good because it encourages more answers, but it also I think makes the students feel overwhelmed. They're like, I just don't even know how I can even start. I actually addressed that a little bit in this outline, which was not a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, on the first page, um, I gave I gave uh, examples of. A very, very broad prompt, right? This, uh, uh, Liz, what's one from either one, two, three, or four that you kind of were imagining as a, as a broad prompt, but is still useful for encouraging? You, you could still encourage creativity through. Um, Habit number three: assign a paper exploring <laughs> how the development of the technology of communication affects the behavior of religious fundamentalists. <laughs> That I just came up. I mean, I just came up at the top of my head when I was making this list. But um, it's obviously what's the most broad question you can ask and try to answer in the research paper. The, the 
the, and by most broad, I mean the worst and most difficult to, to answer, the one that would require the most amount of work that would be the most daunting. I guess it would be, does the development of technology affect with the behavior of religious fundamentalists? Yeah. So, um, it implies that you have an answer in mind, right? Right. That's a, probably a scary thing for prompts, right? So you mm -hmm. just think that there's something that they're supposed to say. Mm -hmm. So you're right, Liz. There, a prompt, a prompt will, will make it, reading a prompt and trying to respond to a prompt, you're trying, you are trying to um, answer it in, in, in its own terms as opposed to being creative. Aaron? I'm just going to follow up on this. I'm also in the writing program. And, um, I'm finding that the students in the um, in the first year core, now that they're not doing research papers, but they're still getting prompts, and it's a similar sort of problem where seeing questions written on a page, sometimes there'll be three or four questions in the prompt because it'll be you know exploring different elements of I don't know character Pericles, but then a lot of them will think I need to now answer all these questions, and once I've done that, I've completed the assignment. Right. Uh, yeah. So turning the prompt into a problem is how to try to, try to speak about that. So let's put it, we're going to put a sticky on, on that idea of how to make a prompt, maybe we'll get back to it at the end, how to make a prompt that is, that encourages creativity. Um, these are just some other ones. Students often formulate research questions that are too large in scope. I guess we already figured, that we already discussed this. How can instructors help students formulate questions that suit the life of the tiny research paper question mark? Um, I guess this we already sort of talked about this. Um, the, the prompt is our broad questions, and of course you have to narrow it down. Um, what, in, in my opinion, and this is something that I'm going to address, the, the best way to, to address this problem is the students, let's say a student comes to you and says they, they want to do this project that there's absolutely no way they can possibly do. Um, you say, okay, do, have you read anything? They say, no. You say, read this. And, um, and I'll, I will, I'm going to walk you through some steps, um, just um, my own steps that I think are helpful. Any other reactions to this problem? All right. Students often formulate research questions based on secondary source material. Does, any, does anyone know exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about? It's, it's not our job as, as um, writers to just report back what other people have said, right? Done? Oh, you just listening to um, uh, All too often, um, young people, 18, 19 year olds, 27 year olds, are influenced, by, uh, are influenced a lot by, by scholars. They read secondary sources, they read people who they think are really interesting, people who they want to be, people who, whose careers they want to emulate, and they tend to, instead of engaging in a conversation with secondary sources, codify the conclusions, which is, which is definitely a problem. Any other thoughts? Is it a problem to codify the conclusions of of scholars, because once you codify a conclusion of a scholar, that's not a secondary source anymore. Now it's a primary source because you're discussing it as um, you're engaging it in a different way. I think that's an important thing is evaluating the sources that you have, mm -hmm. um, recognizing that certain sources may be biased in one direction or another, and, mm -hmm. and you see that problem of students um, just taking what the secondary source says as absolute fact. Right. Um, yeah. Is there one way to get around it while also making use of the primary sources in a constructive way? Is if they're reading primary sources, then you know you can tackle a question or focus on a question in the that's coming up in all the primary sources that scholars do not agree about, mm -hmm. and use that to formulate a question that you're going to look into, even yeah. if others have answered it, and then you're you're combining it, and that your part of your task is now to potentially evaluate the different positions. Yeah, that makes for space for your opinion. That's a terrific line of inquiry. I'll, I'll try, to, try to talk about more lines of inquiry. Jordan? I'm sorry, what, what is a research paper? <laughs> like, I mean, I guess I can think of a few definitions, but I just don't really. What are a few? Well, like, are, are we talking about a research paper in terms of let's go grab a bunch of sources from the library? And try and you know wrestle with them. Is it an essay prompt? Is it responding to an essay? Mm -hmm. Is it you know 
an idea born out of some reading from the course that you're exploring in more depth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how long is it? Is this sort of, is this a full, if it's a 10 week quarter, is it a, is it a, a project for the whole quarter? Is it a capstone sort of thing or is it somewhere in between? Well, to answer your question, I think, I think what I, the way I was formulating this was a term paper, a paper that is the work of a student to be to evaluate that student on the work for a ten week quarter or a fifteen week semester. Mm -hmm. But it could not really be any of those yeah, things that you mentioned. Right. Yeah. As long as they're going and finding some readings apart from what's being assigned from class. Apart right. From it's class. right, it's clearly all those things. Mm -hmm. um, um, let's try to think as broadly as possible. Yeah, the reason I the reason I like qualified my earlier statement that the stuff I was grading weren't research papers out is they're not expected to look at any material other than what they have in front of them. Right? So they're not using any secondary sources. And that's the trick with this is that it's you have to be able to teach them how to evaluate these secondary sources and to use them constructively without just replacing, you know, okay, now I'm, instead of looking at the Peloponnesian War, I'm looking at you know Professor X or and I just wonder if you can do both of these necessarily at the same time. Because a 100 level course, like if you were to do intro to New Testament, for example, is do you a whole lot of material to cover, and there's no way to really go deep enough with the material to formulate your own really good questions. I mean, I wonder if it would be better in that case to have a list of, here's all the questions, here's a bunch of questions, pick one of these, and then the main thing to focus on with that research paper then would be teaching them how to uh, interact with primary and secondary sources rather than, uh, you know, in maybe a 300 level course or capstone sort of course, then you can say, okay, now sure. focus on your own. They're different kind of projects, yeah. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Has, anyone, has anyone ever done or assigned or done a project like that? Yeah. 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 I think I have. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, definitely, there there are classes that I would fully agree should not have research papers assigned in them, mm -hmm. right? I, I think Jordan, you were saying about Chevelle's intro yeah. to the Hebrew Bible I class. Think the same example. Yeah, the, um, yeah, you're right. There's, that, that's not the point of that class, right? right? You sort of think about what you're teaching, uh, what you want to teach. But I always struggled with that with intro to Hebrew Bible because it was like, am I just teaching content, or do I want to get something else in here too? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like, you know, I don't know, the answers to life's important questions, <laughs> you know, so. why they shouldn't Google things to, <laughs> you know, to find the answer, uh, things like that. I don't know if this is appropriate at this stage of your presentation. I just, I just really don't, like, the idea of sending students to the library and just getting whatever they want, I just seem to be resistant to that, like, because it's, it's just like a huge swimming pool of books that you have no idea, you know, how to brace yourself. Mm -hmm. And and is it better for us to just, you know, sort of like get a short list and know these really well? Is that better for the student than to just say, you know, go find a bunch of sources? Because they're not going to, they're not going to do what they're supposed to do, which is really consume more than they're going to present in a paper mm -hmm. to really understand them all. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think it's definitely important to to not have them engage with things that aren't useful. Right, how do you do that, I guess? How do you do that? Uh, I guess, from my experience teaching, one way to do it is, um, I mean, it's hard when you have a lot of students, but basically, if you're trying to teach how to write something, um, you have to teach how to write something. I'm going to say, go write a mm -hmm. research paper. So basically, the entire research paper itself needs to be scaffolded. You have to like say like at the beginning of the quarter like let's develop questions for your research papers and then a few weeks later it's like all right let's start talking about what kind of sources you want to be using and by like halfway through the quarter they should be thinking about you know yeah. what direction they're going in and then an outline I'm sure so that at the end of the quarter they're not like ooh there's the swimming pool let's go get the sources you know like, they need to like they need they need their hands held really if they never know. From a librarian's perspective, too, that um, I, I get a lot of students who, yeah, are, are sort of 
dropped into the pool <laughs> and, and it's hard to help them, right? Because often they come to find me at the 11th hour, you know, and I, like, I need primary sources on this crazy random thing, you know, and so um, it certainly, uh, I think it behooves everybody involved, <laughs> right, <laughs> to, um, to think that through a bit. And yeah, I just remember, like, grabbing the first thing I saw. Yeah. And another problem is if you have the library that's not the reg, I mean, right. what happens there? Mm -hmm. um, but well, sometimes having a library that's not the right would actually be helpful, yeah. right? Because yeah. we have so much. Grab what's there, and you're, you learn how to use the index really quickly. Yeah. Find where they talk about what you're talking mm -hmm. about, and then you just go from yep. there. And, I don't know, I just find it so short circuit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually had a professor who, in, uh, as an undergrad in the very first class, we spent the, it was a two hour class, we spent the entire time in the library. And he went through and showed where all the primary sources that were relevant were, where all the secondary sources were. Is that helpful? And then, yeah, and then he had the, that was the first half of the class, and the second half was explanations of uh, if this source is older than 19, you know, if this source is more than 10 years old, you need to think about whether or not uh, this is a useful source. What kind of class was This was an intro to hermeneutics. It was over for her. I guess we're already we're already addressing like this. Um, this is the last page of the problems. So we'll start talking about solutions. I promise. Um, uh, we already. I think we can move past this. We realize it's a problem. Um, and so long as so long as uh, the library keeps growing, <laughs> it'll always be a problem. But I like. Um, that's a that's a really good solution. Um, uh, any any others before we move on? Yes, As related to that, um, and it's useful that the librarians in the room is how I guess how much is it cheating to sort of have the librarian do that in the first <laughs> session or something? It's <laughs> you, not cheating at all. When professors try to co-op you into their classes or something to do something like that. Yeah, I definitely do that. I do that, for instance, at, at multiple levels. I do that for the BA religion course. I do that for the MAPH uh, philosophy class. I do that for philosophy PhD students. So, um, and many of my colleagues do. And, and in general, where you are teaching, if you, as long as you give them a, a decent amount of lead time, uh, I think uh, the librarians at your institutions would be more than happy to, to help with that um, of coming to the classroom or you could schedule something at the library where they could walk you through um, and I think especially if you're at an institution that at a different institution than this one that you're not familiar with the system I would encourage you to do it that way because you're just not going to know how that system works right um, then. So it's not cheating in any regard. I mean, that's you know, like literally their job. So it's uh, yeah. yeah. Um, electronic resources using Google. <laughs> Many problems <laughs> do arise. Um, any thoughts? I mean, I have many thoughts. <laughs> Professor and I uh, the professor and I actually made a list of electronic resources that they are not allowed to cite in the paper. And so do you remember what some of those were? Um like Wikipedia and um I, I think I saw the list of them, but yeah. Yeah. It was on there actually. Um, there's so it was just a bunch of different things, but then we gave them other like the library website like you could go through and like search like EBSCO or things like that so we're like if you want to do things online like this is the way to do it do not right use these sites or use these instead kind of thing. that's definitely great and that's also a time investment on the teacher's part because I mean we all know how to do that we all know how to use JSTOR we all know how to use EBSCO we all know how to how to use different in in indices that are that are compiled by scholars in our field and go to man's go to man's way and get it. It is a time investment on the time on the part of the teacher because how I mean it takes a few hours to learn how to do that if you have absolutely no idea how to do it. Mm -hmm. I think we also need to give convincing accounts of why they should be doing things this way and not what makes more sense and what's more accessible and what's easier. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to 
give you know, a real, real account of that, not just say, well, this isn't how things are done. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I have an interesting one for Wikipedia. Why do you think Wikipedia is, a, is, is incitable? What is the re I mean, we all know Wikipedia is incitable, but what's the reason? Because anybody can go on there and contribute. Anyone can go on there and contribute to it is, I think, I mean, yes, but I think the real reason is because it, they're related. It changes, so like, you can't go, you can't, you can cite something, but there's no, there's no, um, there's no record of, of the different iteration. Right, there really isn't. Of right. the different editions. Of right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, but I mean, what you and I said are obviously linked. Um, so that's maybe you can say that to a student about Wikipedia. Yeah. Wikipedia they want. But even even something like Google. Yeah. Say you know, like here I am, freshman student. I'm I'm going to do research on X, and how do you convince enough to do that? Yeah, why not just type in what I'm looking for and use that as my starting point for, all right, now here's all this stuff that I can look at, and now I know more about the topic. Perhaps you can say, until artificial intelligence <laughs> has been perfected, the human, the human mind will always be able to sort through things better than yeah. I think it is also helpful to actually bring some example, like do some searches for them and show them what you get and That's walk a through idea. of like, yeah. you know, like, a, you know, if you do a search on, King David, you know, most of the stuff, and then just go through the sites, and some of it looks looks okay, but then if you start looking at, okay, what is this website, who produces it, and uh, then you start seeing, oh, okay, maybe these people have, you know, maybe the Church of Latter-day Saints has some, you know, <laughs> ulterior motives of why they're presenting King David this way, you know. That was actually one of the essay questions I signed yeah. for that exam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Was, uh, discuss discuss different interpretations different interpretations and uh, uh, of, of David <laughs> traditions. Um, so so these are the problems. But I think I think we ought to start. I'd like so I'd like to introduce a vocabulary, a <laughs> vocabulary for helping for to to help students understand how to use sources and what sources are. Um, I don't know if it's a useful vocabulary, but I, I, I found it to be I found it to be um, um, systematic. So, primary primary sources, secondary primary sources, primary secondary sources, and secondary secondary sources. So I'll, I'll walk you through what I think all of these are. And I, I mean, obviously, I'm not telling you this is how you all should write your papers. I'm I'm saying this is a potential way to for, to. To, to frame it for students so that they can sort of see what they ought to be doing to be creative. Also, I want to focus on this concept of free writing exercises. Um, there is a, there is a, there is a, <clears throat> an author by the name of Peter Elbow, who's, who's, I guess I can pass this around. This is a terrific book. It's called Writing Without Teachers. Um, it's, um, the title is funny because he, he makes the argument that, well, you can learn yourself. You can, learn, you, can be a, you can teach yourself. So the student can teach himself or herself. But the, te but the teacher really requires a student. So um, the, uh, the relationship of dependency is actually the teacher requires the student. <laughs> um, so it, um, and the basic, um, yeah, this is the, this is the uh, basic outline for, for, this, uh, for this particular book. Um, you want to encourage quantity over quality first. Um, why might that be a good idea? Quantity over quality first. So we can still come up on whether we're writing what's right. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. We don't, we don't get the point where we value it. Right. You need to be able to put the words in the right order. Try that. Try out different ways of phrasing things. Um, don't go back into lead. Don't go at it. Don't you know? Just just write. Even writing with by hand. I think this is. Um, I, I don't think there were computers around when this book was written. <laughs> so it's all he, the vocabulary he uses has to do with like the hand and like, the pen. Right? I, I think you can still do it on a computer, even though it's so easy to backspace. And it tells you when you've written a, uh, when you've uh, written a word, in, uh, when you've uh, misspelled a word, and 
you can't. Uh, <laughs> you can turn spell check off. Ah, turning spell check off. You can turn uh, grammar check off. So quant quantity over over quality um, can can turn the, can turn the project of writing into something reductive because because everyone writes garbage, right? Everyone writes garbage. There's never been an author ever in the history who just wrote and it was in its final form. We, say it again. <laughs> we, we all, and we know this, we all look at our, the things we've written and we take things out. Um, so free writing is, is helpful to encourage being creative, being bold, being daring, being uh, unique, and allows you to then reduce, whittle down. You want to, it wants, you should make it a sculpture, not a painting. Uh, <laughs> um, thoughts? Has anyone tried this? Yeah? Sarah, what's your experience? Uh, Demons write all papers this way. Right, actually. it's fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I, first of all, I can't spell and I can't type, and so if I try to do either of those things while I'm actually, actually trying to think, it like is just not successful. Mm -hmm. So I definitely, I've gotten faster at it because that I can, I overwrite less than I used to. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely sort of, not to say I don't outline, but I need laser. I, I do because I write that way. I do think about the fact that, like, when, when professors would assign, as an undergraduate, would assign me, I give them an outline. Mm -hmm. It was often very unhelpful because, like, right. the outline I would create for myself was often not intelligible to other right. human beings. And in this, case, and I would often then write the paper right back, yeah. mm -hmm. right. which was silly mm -hmm. and not productive. Um, Peter Elbow discourages writing outlines too early in the process. I think there is a time for outlines, but I don't think it's day one of research. <laughs> So, I mean, just, you know, practically, do you have them turn in the quantity to make sure they're doing it? Yeah, so Because there's a value in, in, in the rewrite, right? Right. But they have to do the first thing first. Yeah, so what I'm, I mean, what I'm, what I'm going to suggest are four iterations, you know, four. Four um, But of course, this is just, this is just the vocabulary and nothing that I'm, I'm sure. I would say you do, especially if you're an adjunct teacher, especially if you're still writing your dissertation, you also really want to think about how much time you're putting into teaching. And if you want to be, you, you want to maybe think about it in relation to how much you're being paid to do that teaching as well. Um, because especially while you're still um, writing your dissertation, that should be your first priority, right? <laughs> and you don't want to be putting in 30 hours a week to grading right. and Two yeah. hours a week to dissertation yeah, write. Yeah, I agree. I'm there. just trying to get out of <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, what's turned in ends up being the free write. Yeah, no, I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually not suggesting um, four rough drafts. Mm -hmm. I'm suggesting, and I'm also not suggesting grading either, mm -hmm. um, because you can't really grade something where the expectation is you're going to write things that are bad. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> this um, isn't bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> you must write worse sentences. Uh, worse sentences. Yeah, that sentence is no. I think, it, but I think it um, encouraging. You, you can only really encourage this if you assign it. Um, and maybe yes. Aaron. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, okay. I do love it. Okay. Well, um, I guess my one of my worries about this is I suspect it's sort of similar to Jordan's. Maybe it's because my students are first years, but I've been doing everything in my power to get them to outline. Mm -hmm. Precisely because what their finished papers look like is free writing. Mm -hmm. right, exactly. Um, and so I just wonder, you know, in the simplest sort of way that we need to teach them the, the tools of research, the processes, you know, how to get from point A to point B, I think revision is something that they don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so to say, start with a free write and then revise it, well, that's well and good. I don't really know how to do that, much less how to teach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perhaps, and what I'd like to do. I, I'd like to, what I want to do is get through all my slides so then we have a full, um, a full picture. And then, then we'll break it down, then we'll rip it, then we'll tear it apart. Because I, I um, just like any free writing, we ought, it ought to be productive. Uh, I, I free wrote this one. But you revised it. So I revised it, it but it, it ought to go through another um, revision. Um, so I'll, let's go quickly through and then we'll, we'll rip it to shreds. So what is a primary, primary source? This is, this is vocabulary, I hope it's useful. Um, sources that serve as the main focus. So these are the ones you want to read most carefully and critically. Um, if you are writing a paper and 
it, the name of a source is in the title of the paper. That's your primary mm -hmm. primary source. Other thoughts? Um, what is what can be a primary primary source? I mean, this is pretty clear, right? This is the easiest one to really think about. Liz? Um, I think that one of the things that um, students sometimes have a problem with also is just like between primary and secondary. So these are like the main focus, but they're also the main focus of like the actual primary source. So I just have writings about that book or whatever your actual primary source is. And I think maybe it's, I'm not really sure why these students were confused, but I think maybe it was because we were looking at primary sources, but they were like in translation, so they were finding everything in English. So they were like, well, these, like I wouldn't found this on my own, so that's a primary source, because it wasn't like a sign guess that you were writing, or, you know, so like even defining those before you can get to your primary source. That's, that's something I, I'm, I, uh, I'm trying, at least trying to address with this. Um, quickly. And, and, what I, and what I'm suggesting is a free writing exercise as a reaction after reading your primary primary source. This is, I think, extremely important because you don't want to be too influenced by what other people say. Um, again, I, I'm calling, I call this presentation Encouraging Creativity. Um, research questions ought to arise from, from your reaction to a primary source. Thoughts? Oh, and I wrote some uh, some sample questions that you could assign. There are probably endless um, possible questions you can assign on such a free writing exercise. What was surprising about the text? Was there something that you were expecting that turned out to be different? Um, which is the yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I assume that we can just post the slides, a PDF of the slides on the website, right? right. So that people can access it. Yeah, I tried to do a printout, but. Um, it was an enormous. Right, set. we didn't want to. It was like 17 pages, mm -hmm. and I didn't know how to do the thing where you have like three on a page and then the, like the notes section on the side. Sorry. Um, um, yeah, what seems to be the purpose of the text if it's not expressed explicitly? It is unknown who seems to be the intended audience of the text. I mean, there's a zillion, zillion questions you can ask other, others. Spit, spitballing, broad questions. Mm -hmm. Questioning the text itself, for instance, what seems to be the purpose of the text, even if it is expressed explicitly. Ah, very good, excellent. Um, others. So, um, right. encouraging students to react at, at first reading, because uh, of course, what they what what uh, is a tendency, and what I've done, of course, and what we've all done, is read everything, primary, secondary, no order, and it's just a chaos, and then. And then, uh, and then the day before it's due, we start writing. <laughs> um, so I think uh, encouraging this sort of systematic way is, is possible. What's a secondary primary source? So what I'm, so a secondary primary source works by the author of your primary primary source that are, that are not going to be the focus of your research. And I'm suggesting reading for fun, reading as if you're reading for fun, not taking too many notes, but encouraging, encouraging students to um, to read without without thinking too much about analyzing these these sources, um, and I think it's it could be beneficial for allowing students to gain erudition in in the field without having too much pressure to synthesize everything. Um, if this were us, we would take notes and and be very diligent about reading of the secondary primary sources, but we're not freshmen. Um, but I think it is important to, if you're reading... Can you get an example? Yeah, so if, let's say you're going to write a paper on, let's say you're going to write a paper on a novel, let's say you're going to write a paper on um, a license. Mm -hmm. Should you read another Steinbeck novel? Probably. Um, do you have to incorporate everything from that other Steinbeck novel into, into what you're writing? No, but um, that's just a, a very basic example. Other thoughts? Is this useful? Is this, will this send people far afield and astray? I find it's really useful. Because it, it helps to give some texture for what can look impenetrable. I mean, there's all this stuff, and now we're doing some higher art. 
the video you're writing on this, this is what's at the center. Right? That doesn't mean other things aren't relevant, but we can give we can give some measure of um, relevance, mm -hmm. some gradation of relevance. Right? Mm -hmm. Reading Rauschenbusch on his uh, theology for the social gospel is really difficult if you don't read Christianity and the social crisis first. Mm -hmm. so that's that, so. I actually like the idea of that you could open it up to the students to say, you know, the, their secondary primary sources, is, it's their choice of what they want that to be, right? right? So yeah. that they can have some control and, and because and then it actually might be fun, right? right. That it doesn't have to be everything. Right. Yeah. And just say, you know, think about things that you might, that might be relevant. It gives them thinking about, you know, the context of the, the primary primary and they, yeah, they might actually find something that they're just reading out of pure interest, mm -hmm. right? Which is really hard. Like, I don't know about you, but once I started graduate school, it was like all of a sudden I wasn't reading for fun anymore. <laughs> it became a chore, and it was a little sad, right? So, um, you know, um, And if anyone has enough, like, alternative form of vocabulary, secondary, primary. Right. <laughs> okay. okay. And then, of course, I would encourage free writing again. Rewriting again at this stage, students ought to go back to their original questions and address them in in light of new information. New, what are new types of questions that may emerge? Um, of course, how are they different? Um, what what are the unique qualities of the primary primary source? What makes it stand out? Um, does the primary primary source seem to undermine the secondary primary source or the other way around? Is a maybe a higher level question. What are some other questions that can emerge after you, after a student has completed both of these reading assignments. What do you think? Development. Yeah. The way one thing is for transforming the board. Mm -hmm. um, also, what exactly could be? I I suggested that a secondary primary source could be another work by the same author of what you're analyzing. But what else could it, could it be? Because it could be something else. Well, like, you know, if you're writing on biblical poetry, you know, I think a secondary primary source would just read poetry broadly and understand mm -hmm. what what is poetry. Or Ugaritic poetry in translation. Right, right. But that's not mm -hmm. that's not a secondary source. They're not commenting on your primary source. You're 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 not engaged in Oh, I would say it's a still a primary source. That's what I mean. Right. It's yeah. not a secondary. Right. Not a primary, secondary, or a secondary. Yeah. <laughs> It's a secondary primary because it's informing you about yeah the discourse in which you're you're beginning to right you know get participate. Other thoughts on what could be a secondary primary source or a level two source? <laughs> <laughs> level, one, level one. Level one, level two. Yeah, it is it is confusing, I guess, especially for non-native English speakers. <laughs> okay. um, uh, there's nothing you can do to get away from. Terminology, right? <laughs> and so this, it's at this point that I would suggest that you encourage students to formulate a thesis, um, if it's going to be a paper with a thesis. Before going to secondary sources, before you're too influenced by what other people have said, to, I think this, this is the way to encourage students to be creative. They ought not formulate their theses as sort of, you don't want to, your goal isn't to prove someone else's idea. Uh, thoughts on this? Has anyone ever, I mean, I've fallen into this trap, of course. Because um, I, the, the, the trap is reading secondary sources first and then going and reading your primary sources and having, you know, you're, you're, um, you're reading them through a certain lens that's not really true. Oh, I totally agree. That is a danger. I don't know if I'd call it a thesis, because that's so formal. It is. And you're almost, you know, when I got to the point where I had a thesis, I felt like I was starting to write. You know what I mean? Or a finished product. Whereas, I think you're just saying, have a thought in mind about what you think about what you've been reading. That's amazing. Because you might get to the secondary literature and realize it is garbage, what you just came up with, because it's <laughs> false. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And if you're too invested in that as a thesis statement, you that's might feel like you just wasted. That's good. Time. And I don't address that here. So that's good to I mean that's good to just keep in mind that you, there are stages where you can revise you know, your your statement, your idea, what that's really Or you might find that it's not garbage, it's just been said already by everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing, but it might if you're locked into a thesis already. For dissertation. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
the undergraduate level doesn't seem to be too much of a problem if they're recreating somebody else's idea. I mean, it's probably unlikely that it'll be um, you know, delivering something radically new on the world, but you know, what, what they do produce, as you say, is their own voice and their own eye. And I don't know, I, I, I agree that they don't need to consult the secondary literature before formulating it. A thesis that doesn't isn't represented by it. Mm -hmm. So, so in in some assignments, you could stop here, right? Because in some assignments, you're not going to the students are not going to be consulting secondary sources, and then and then this would be the the, the, the final stage of preparation, and then writing. But I want to keep going to secondary sources if they are if you are making an assignment in which they are going to consult secondary sources. There are primary secondary sources. So you can, of course, this is the hardest part, right? This is like um, what, what we were talking about for 20 minutes at the start of this workshop, S sending students to the library to find, to find secondary sources. This is the hardest part. I think um, helping out students to narrow it down by simply giving them a reading list is a way to do it, right? Um, Encouraging them to find their own reading list, though, I think is possible um, um, so, long as, so long as you discourage students from engaging sources that are tangentially related. Yoni, how many things have been written on my monitor? <laughs> okay. uh, if you're going to write a paper on my monitor, are you going to consult every source I've ever written about my monitor? Probably not. Probably. Um, uh, I would jump in as, as from the library, library's perspective, think a little bit too about what are the resources you're sending them to to find these secondary sources. Um, so like when I talk to like, often for like BA papers, really at least here, they can do most of their secondary searching in our catalog, right? Um, that they don't have to go much further from the books that we own and then the, the bibliographies in those books. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, I can show them like the ATLA religion database, but in a lot of ways that might be too much. And it might be better to, for them to look just at JSTOR, which has, a, a, um, a, you know, for, for when you're writing in graduate level, you want something broader, but JSTOR is, uh, it searches across the humanities, but there's not a whole lot in religion, right? So they'll just get like a snapshot of, of some articles. Does anyone else have any thoughts about um, encouraging students to use da da databases versus just giving them a reading list of secondary sources? Well, the reading list of secondary sources, I feel like, would only work if all of your students were writing the same research paper. Sure. So if you did this yeah. collectively and you came up with a research topic, like, collectively, where everyone had the same thesis, then it could work. But if you're having different theses, it would be possible, but a lot of work for the teacher to come up with. Yeah, it's a time investment, of course. Of Different. Right. So, I guess the debate is between investing time and. <laughs> well, that's yeah, also an interesting time. that you can outsource to a librarian, right? Yeah. You can send them. You can tell them to set up a consultation time with with a librarian to look at to start building a bibliography. Right. But you could have them submit a draft to the bibliography, right. and then mm -hmm. you could recommend holes. Right. Yeah, that, that's less work on. That's less work, but you definitely want to encourage students. Look, you toss some things. You can't, you can't read everything. Uh, don't be afraid. You don't have to cover every single, you know, base. If it's not, if it's tangentially related, don't use it. If it directly addresses the questions that you've already raised, that you've created on your own, that are yours and nobody else's, um, um, that's good. That's meant, that might be something to read. Maybe you can cap it. Maybe you can cap it to three articles. Four articles. Um, one book. Undergrads have a hard time finding articles. Yeah, it's. Yeah. <laughs> They're better finding books than um, A free writing assignment after this. They, I, I, we don't have to go through all, all these bullet points, but I would say the main point is you want students, or I would love, want students to see what they're writing as being in conversation with their secondary sources. Um, just because they're, they're lowly undergrads, it doesn't mean that they have to necessarily, that they have to 
back away and just agree with some other scholar who's written on the topic, they should, you should encourage them to um, make assertions. And there's nothing wrong with that. No one's going to come arrest them if they're wrong. <laughs> they can still write an A paper if even if they're wrong. Um, you could, you could, I mean, you could give them an A, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Um, but what are some ways to encourage students to see what they're doing as being part of the conversation, as opposed to um, proving one right or proving one wrong or trying to tear, tear down their own argument thoughts? I guess what I, I mean, I still struggle with this. <laughs> I definitely struggle with this. I, I want to be in. I want to be in conversation with, with scholars who are these, you know, great names who um, everyone knows. I think um, in my own writing, I get at this by trying to limit my engagement with one one source. That's a good idea. Because if you're just, you know, following along mm -hmm. with their line of discussion. You're really always coming back to that. You're just reproducing. Mm -hmm. But if you can get to the core of what their thesis is, and that fits into your paper within the context of a much larger ongoing discussion in your own voice, mm -hmm. right? It shows that you're, you know, you're you're conversing with them. You're not just restating what they're saying. At the end, I'm going to show you an outline, and I'm going to try to address what that problem. I, I don't think there should be, there, there can be a lit review section in a paper, but you don't want, you don't want the paper to be a lit review. Right? I think that's the most important thing to remember about enga engaging secondary sources. And secondary, secondary sources, reading for fun. Um, this might be maybe the least important. We're going from most important to least. Um, to really understand what a secondary source author is doing, it's good to get to know that author, get to know who that person is, why they're writing the way they are, what their goals are in writing, what their methods are, what they're, who they're in conversation with. Um, are they really an expert? Um, it's not good, it's good to know if the person you're citing is actually an expert, mm -hmm. or if they are writing in some tangential, on some topic that's tangential to them. Um, that's something that's difficult for uh, undergrads to know, just, just because they don't know. Thank you, Dustin. Um, what are some thoughts on this particular assignment? Assigning, assigning secondary, secondary source reading. There's a question from a previous slide that I think is still relevant. Um, at the bottom two ago, yeah, you say, um, what are the best kinds of sources? And that yeah. makes me think, well, how do you, when you're about, when you have, when you type in to the library catalog, you know, your keyword, you get this list of books, which not only determining which are primary for you, but also what the relative quality of potentially primary, um, primary secondary sources um, versus the ones that you either want to pick up as secondary secondary sources or just ignore all together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you said about like, you know who is this person if they're it didn't it hasn't occurred to me before but really you could just be telling students just Google the author right yeah. <laughs> find out what this person. That could know, be a type of secondary, yeah, secondary source. I, you know what? You know because you know if they're a faculty member somewhere, they're going to have their pertinent information on their website, and you can find out are they a Maimonides scholar or mm -hmm. are they a so, physicist? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's important to try to. It like took me a very long time to think of these people as people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And not just like abstract entities. Right. Who so, know everything? Or I wasn't in history as an undergraduate, but the, the history department. Um, did this thing where they had in like the juniors history seminar. One of the things you had to do was pick a member of the faculty, the history faculty, and you had to read everything they had written. Ooh. Essentially, not everything, but yeah. like a, a large swath of what they had written. Mm -hmm. you, I think they like you didn't have to read the dissertation. You had to read like the introduction. You had to read like a chapter from the dissertation and then like, a book or two. And it was a really and then you went and like talked to this person yeah. who was like you know a living being. Yeah. Um, and it was a really, actually, I have a lot of friends who did this assignment, but it's actually very clever. Yeah. Because if you get a sense of like, oh, this is like a person who has like an arc of their career, and they're like interested in the question, and their view yeah. changes over time, and something like that. Yeah. So it, it was actually a kind of interesting assignment. But I think, it's yeah, really interesting assignment. the idea of trying to get people to, to kind of know these people, to think of the people as human beings. How could you do that without the going and talk to the person at the end aspect? I mean, I think you just like, 
for people who are still alive, it's like just really useful mm -hmm. to like look at you know Google, like put them into their university's website and like you see their picture and like there they are with their dog and like there. <laughs> <laughs> you can but, look at their you get, academia that edu page. Right, at least get a sense of like what the timeline is like, right? That like right. someone started off interested in X and then they became interested in Y and now they're ready to see right. like how do those things relate to one another? Do you think I do you think I've gone too far for an undergrad with this particular assignment, this particular reading assignment? Probably. Probably. It depends on what the ultimate. I mean, if they're ready for the thesis, yeah. 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 Well, the, I guess the way I formulated the hierarchy of these sources is you could stop at any given one, and that's a different assignment. Mm -hmm. So you could stop at primary, primary sources. Responding to that, that's uh, one kind of assignment. The primary, and then. The primary, primary, and then secondary, primary, that's a different kind of assignment, and so on and so forth. This might be sort of the, the, the capstone, maybe, the in really getting into conversation with, with your secondary source scholars. Um, let's skip that. Putting it all together, order from chaos, one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right. Do what element serve as the backbone to the project? This is we've talked about this using the free writing as the to create your backbone before you outline, and there is disagreement on that. But this is this is a, just a, a kind of outline that can emerge from these free writing exercises. Um, introduction address what's already been said about the topic, right? You um, you want to start off by or now, I'm not saying you all, <laughs> but perhaps this is a good way to frame it for someone who has absolutely no idea what to do. I'm not telling you how to write your papers. Um, but, but you want to you show what, what there is, and then what, what hasn't been addressed, what you want to do. And, and I think these can emerge from the different writing assignments. Um, of course, are there any thoughts on Let's keep going. Then a thesis statement in Jordan. It could be whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not a thesis statement. Um, and then three different arguments in support of your statement um, using evidence in support of your argument um, from assignments one and two, but not three and four. Right? You don't want to codify the conclusions of your secondary, primary. The, you don't want to codify the conclusions of your secondary sources as evidence for what you're trying to say. You want to you want to engage um, you want to engage them in a different way, not as evidence for what you're trying to do. Compare, more importantly, contrast what you're argu uh, what you're arguing with those um, secondary secondary source scholars. Has any, does anyone follow the um, this? This pattern, if you're going to use three arguments, you start with the second, then the third, and then the most convincing at the end. Yeah, because the emphasis yeah. on the most convincing. Yeah. I think that's a, that might be a good tip. Cool. I go back and forth with this because like, I remember early on talking to my first advisor who gave me the helpful advice of like, don't write a mystery novel, right? Is, you know, like to a certain extent, you also want to play your strongest hand mm -hmm. through the whole thing, right? Because you're trying to convince someone. But at the same time, you also want to write something that is enjoyable to read and keeps people reading, right? As opposed to like, well, I just read the first paragraph and they said, what, you know, what's mm -hmm. going on so I can see the rest. But, um, yeah, it's, I think it's good, it's a good, a lot of this is about just always providing students with a model and then they have to go off and do what's best for them. Right. Right? That's because that's true for all of us. All of us. Mm -hmm. And I guess what, what, we're, what I'm trying to do here is sort of paradoxical because I'm saying they should be creative, but they should also follow a model. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you know, I think about this a lot. I don't know if anybody's seen that movie Finding Forrester with the, um, of course, I can't remember the name of the actors. But Sean Connery. Sean Connery, yeah, so he's, you know, this sort of, anyway, he like gives this kid a little bit of his writing to start, and then the kid writes, uh, you know, his own story, but like the first paragraph is, you know, the, um, 
uh, experts, you know, the, so it's a sort of, I think about a lot of writing of like, you sort of start with emulating and following somebody else's example and then through that you can find your own voice. Well, we have 10 minutes left. I'll skip this. I, I really wanted to get people's um, uh, feedback on, because I sat and I was thinking, what is a conclusion? Like, what exactly is a conclusion? And this is the sentence I came up with. A conclusion is a statement, a statement which includes an assertion that the thesis has been demonstrated through the arguments of my evidence. And that took me a long time to, <laughs> but I don't think it's really perfect. Liz, or Aaron? Um, I think the problem, the, the problem I see with that is that if that's true, mm -hmm. then it doesn't need to be there, right? Mm -hmm. If the thesis has been demonstrated, then yeah. this is the opposite problem of the mystery novel. It's yeah. the yeah. joke that retells the joke instead of giving the punchline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the only time, I mean, again, through the writing program, the only time that I ever really appreciate conclusions are like, first I did this, then I did this, then I did this, and this proves this. Mm -hmm. The only time that's helpful is if they didn't actually do it. <laughs> because that will let me make constructive feedback. But if they've actually had a convincing argument, mm -hmm. I, I know. I know that, <laughs> that this has been demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Did you have something? Um, yeah, it was something like that. Okay. And it can be helpful, but it doesn't need to just be a restatement, but it kind of needs to like synthesize, but then also like answer like why that is important. It's more like a conclusion for like an assertion of like, and this is why my paper should have been better kind of thing. Well, we still have, we still have uh, a few minutes, and what I want to do is take down what I've written. <laughs> um, uh, what are just final thoughts? If you uh, I, did, did anyone do the assignment? Elsa, mm -hmm. um, could you? Would you like to share it all? Um, what you? Mm -hmm. I mean, I showed one model. You don't have to share everything you wrote, but what is perhaps another model? Another particular kind of model. Um, well, the paper that I was thinking of involved. I needed involved contemporary news things or like from within the last 10 years um, of, of thing, events that happened in India and so I was trying to find all these trying to find articles in Hindi right and and the frustration with oh well these newspapers didn't start putting their articles online until a few years after that you know and so those kinds of uh, things um, and I was able to interview people for that right and so so that if you're using interviews and writing a paper, that's another level of, of things. Um, I think I think a, a key thing goes back to what Jordan said about like finding as you go along that you're revising your argument. You're learning that oh, this is more complex, or these other there are these other things that I have to address within it. And so, for me, my problem is always I go off on like some tangent of like oh wait, I need to have a little paragraph about this topic, but then I get all into that, right? And so, um, so I think, yeah, how the, how the argument of the paper changes as you go through it, that was. Other thoughts? Thank you, Elsa. Just to support that, I just think the more and more I write, the more I realize the importance of time. Mm -hmm. It just takes time to think through everything you want to say, to give it a shot, to double back, and start again. Um, it just, you just can't. Some people can't. I can't do it well in a short amount of time. And I don't know what that means for the assignment when you start it, how much time you have in a quarter to introduce ideas to begin with. I mean, it's hard. May I get back to Aaron's uh, concern about revising and teaching them revising? The you know, really thinking ahead of time of how much time you have with them and what you want to do. And almost, you know, we think of like the end of the quarter of when the paper is done and when they hand in that draft, but maybe they should be handing something in halfway through, you know, to give them, you know. or maybe you don't worry about revised paper at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> we just revising in about three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> first years. Yeah, let us know. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask. So for this like process of you know building in time for revisions and building in time even to revise like your topic and your thesis and your argument, like how do you imagine that being structured in a quarter? Like, 
quarter of our semester. So we have like these four different sources and like we're trying to get them to use them and like free write on all of them and then come back and do a thesis. Like I feel like you're already at the end of the quarter then by the time you're even starting to actually write the paper. So That's how true. would you suggest? Um, but if you've done all that work, it, it maybe is easier to just put the final touch. That is sort of, yeah, what, that's sort of what I was trying to get at. But maybe it's not. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've done, the, the kind of free writing I do, I only, I only write one kind of paper nowadays, which is uh, um, sort of like reactions to uh, and translations of texts. And the kind of free writing I do is I'll, I'll it's very philological. I'll take a word and I'll make a footnote and I'll just I'll just free write and free write and free write on that word until until there's nothing left to say and then my my whole paper kind of emerges out of out of this philological footnoting exercise. Sort of Borgesian. Yeah. Sort of Borgesian. <laughs> it's it's actually Robinsonian. <laughs> um, but um, uh, um, uh, yeah, I'll I think with the free writing, the challenge is always um, is is teaching students how to let go of the things that they've written yeah, because yeah, you can sure. become you know attached yeah. to the things that you wrote in this emotional free writing mm -hmm. experience, yeah. right? And and so I'm <laughs> I'm thinking about free writing on Simone de Beauvoir. So, yeah. um, <laughs> but like. Like the free writing itself is an experience and is about getting your thoughts ordered. And then after the free writing, coming in with an outline and often just totally throwing aside all the free writing that you did because now those ideas are somewhere in your head, right? And now you can write them in a, in a clearer kind of way. But if you try to just cut and paste from your free writing, sometimes it can work, but sometimes it distracts you from the larger argument that you're yeah. trying to make. Yeah. So to teach kids how to let go of the things that they've constructed, I think that's... that's that is important. Well, um, oh, we have three minutes. We have three minutes in. I was just going to say, I think there, there's a lot of ways you're teaching them confidence and you're teaching them how to deal with anxiety, right? Because uh, there, there's a lot of anxiety around um, grades and, and writing, and that's why people procrastinate. and. Um, and, and, and there's there's a pastoral aspect <laughs> to teaching a research paper. Uh, that it's all like, yeah, it's all teaching, certainly. Um, but because of that uh, very personal side of, of the, it's their ideas, right? And ultimately, you're judging their ideas of whether they're good or not, <laughs> or at least that's often how they they'll, they're going to perceive it, right? Of I'm smart and I'm stupid. So, um, if anyone's interested in helping me, I'm, I am kind of in, into the, the framework. Um, it's obviously not done, um, but email me if you're interested, and maybe we can work together and produce some sort of, if there is a, the Craft of Teaching website, we can post stuff on it. So, it, it might be a fun collaborative effort to have like a finished product of what we've been discussing, um, and we can change it and do whatever. Maybe not invest too much time. It's another thing. Crowdsourcing. Um, yeah, email me um, with any ideas, and, and I'll be in touch with these guys when I'd like to pick something up. Um, on the on the yeah on the website, we'll attach to the, the workshop and schedule, and maybe once we have our, our online library up and running, yeah. we'll there as well. Yeah, yeah. I so I, I really would love it if uh, if you if, some, if you would all email me. I don't know if I much contribute, but I I think it's really good, and I, I think I'll I'll adopt it. And just in terms of thinking about ways in which, you know, I like that you can stop at each stage and there are different kinds of tasks and then you can organize it over the, over the long quarter or semester. I think mean, it's a helpful pair. Well, thank you. Yeah, big thank, thank you. Thank you. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.